The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Zeppo has a degree with a particular maths bent like mine. He's got a Bachelor of Applied Science in Mathematics. Love the maths geeks, go us. Um, has been CEO and director of a variety of deal groups, so has been around in the game for some time. And his ex plant consulting business ended up morphing into what he is here to chat to us about today. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Paul Campbell, woo! Thanks, Pat. Well, great to be here. <laughs> You're very, very welcome. Before we dive into Zeppo and data and, you know, all that sort of stuff, then let's take a moment just to sort of ease us in, get to know you a little bit better through your use of technology. Yep. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Uh, sparingly. So it's probably thumbs okay. up or the thumbs up or the laugh emoji. I try and, uh, you know, nice. avoid don't use them too much, but uh, yeah, they're there. They're quite helpful. But nice. uh, yeah, the thumbs you know, up's a good way of saving typing up. It is, it is. And although I read an article um, in the last few months that was about the difference between, say, our generation and then millennial and Gen Z, and particularly in Gen Z, thumbs up is seen as passive aggressive, would you believe? Oh, so, really? Okay. Yep, right. which was something I didn't know either. So I'm like, oh, no, yep. I'm, I wonder what else my emojis <laughs> say. Like, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm speaking a language I didn't know. Yeah, um, well, I've but, learned something today if nobody else right, does, so that's right. good to know. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> So then let's move on to your smartphone. You know, we're all permanently attached to them. If you had to wipe every app off them and just keep three, which one? Which three would you keep? Yeah, good question. Uh, start with weather zone. I'm always uh, wanting to know what the weather looks like, probably okay. because of what happens in the other two apps, which is uh, wiki camps. Um, <laughs> love my travel. We love to uh, tour around with our caravan, get into the outback. Oh, fantastic. So, uh, wiki camps is a great way of finding uh, where to stay, uh, on a really, you know, just winging it, heading out to the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And as you can imagine, the weather zone goes with that. Mm -hmm. And my third one would be my golf app um, in terms of love my golf. And yeah. uh, it's a great little app to keep scores, get your distance. Um, so, yeah, that'd be my top three, I think. Look, it was my dad was just saying the other day that they're now doing, which I didn't know, doing it all via app, you know, rather than the old yeah. days with the tiny little pencil that, Never works on the little bit of paper and all that sort of stuff. But the um, golf app's really interesting, actually. The you, with the Apple Watch connected, it's actually doing all your biometrics. It can actually give you feedback on your golf swing. It's going. It's getting quite scientific as to uh, wow. what it's tracking. It's really clever. That's amazing. It is. It's really cool. So that's uh, interesting technology and taking golf to other level. It tells you how bad your swing is, which can be depressing. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's not what I did. You know, <laughs> arguments with people yelling at their wrists yep. with their Apple Watch. I can just yeah, it, see it. <laughs> some of it's good, some of it's bad. <laughs> All right. Let's dive into Zeppo, shall we? So yep. we'll start at the top. I'm assuming, look, most people have at the very least heard um, about you guys, but just in case they haven't, let's start with the high level. 
in the advice tech space or fintech space, you know, what category do you guys sort of fall under? Who are you normally lined up against? You know, you know, so where do you fit? Yeah, we're kind of probably what we built Zeppo to kind of try and bring data together. That was the starting point. So we we talk to a lot of wealth tech business or wealth businesses rather, and mm. they would generally have an accounting or self-managed super fund or mortgage broking angle as well. And so we started seeing a real gap in the ability to create a single client view. Like how do mm. I actually truly understand who my client is and what it means to me and where are the opportunities? So in many regards, we've kind of taken on a pretty unique challenge, which is um, trying to fight the data dilemma. <laughs> so- there are people that kind of do bits of it, but in terms of uh, the breadth and depth we go to at the moment, there's probably no one that actually focuses on it like we do, to be yep. fair. Yep. There's lots of overlap with other components, but okay. at its core, I think um, at the moment we're probably pretty unique in that regard in terms of particularly that integrated vertical market that we try to tackle. So um, it's all about that single client view for us. Okay, so let's talk about how that came up then. There's clearly for you to want to do that, which – I mean, some of us would think you were mad to even try. <laughs> uh, I'd agree with that, actually. It, it I was, mean, what the hell? Oh, who wants to Murgatroyd? Like, it's hard yep. enough to get, you know, two apps that it can in any way connect on terms of data. So I'm curious what the trigger point was. Like, what was the work you were doing that sort of caused you to go, all right, we need to do this a different way. We need to approach this a different way. Yeah, so when we first started 10 years ago with the, um, the, the advice side of things, we would go into a lot of uh, – big firms, and we would see that they're running accounting and planning in the same firms. Mm. And so we just said to them, look, you know, how are you how are you running a business like that? We've well, got multidisciplinary challenges. You know, just curious for us. We we're just saying, how are you doing that? And the phrase holy grail came up a lot where they would say, look, we'd love a single view. That's the holy grail for us. But it just doesn't seem to exist. Interesting. And we heard it enough time. Oh, see, sorry. My um, – Lights are going up. There we go. Sorry about that. You're Obviously, right. we're very economical focused. Um, <laughs> technology. Um, <Yeah. laughs> I'm not moving around enough, but um, <laughs> the we heard it enough times that we came back and said, you know, there's actually something here. There's there's a real gap that no one seems to have wanted to tackle. And to your point, now that we've done it, we know why. Yeah. But um, and so we ended up then going to a large integrated firm in Adelaide called Perks, and we, we talked to them about the idea, and they said, look, we love this idea. Let's work together to actually ch- tackle this challenge. So okay, it was quite a, an adventure because we didn't even know if we could do it. So how do we bring in accounting data, um, self-managed super fund, all of that stuff? So it was, it was quite a project. Um, yeah. And it's been quite a journey. And I'm betting too, because what's interesting is the Zeppo as a concept actually got flagged to me first from within a dealer group, right? Yep. So that's that was them because they're like, oh, we need better yeah. insights into all of this data. So clearly it morphed beyond the um, – silo offering of a of a holistic practice, you know, so trying to get yeah. across the silos within a practice and has evolved beyond that. So and I'm curious about the different layers of users. So there's, you know, the um whoever the individual, you know, interacting with a client is so they can sort of see into the different things that are happening for that client maybe across different services. There's clearly the business yeah. Across and but also then potentially, you know, overarching might be a dealer group. So, so talk me through how each of those layers work. Yeah. Again, when we got all the data together, that one of the it was a bit of a so what moment. So <laughs> they went, oh, this is fantastic. Now, now what do we do with it? Yeah. And it was probably like having a smartphone with no apps. Back to your point. So they said, <laughs> this is fantastic, but without any enablement, it really doesn't. It's got yeah. no currency. So we kind of got there and went, oh, okay, we've we've done a we've done a lot of good work, but what do we do with it? <laughs> so, um, so then we went on a bit of a a journey to figure out how to make this data, you know, valuable to the asset. So, in many cases, data is not very sexy, right? So it's mm. just everyone kind of knows it's there, but have been so pre- preoccupied with other challenges they haven't been able to leverage it. So, I think with my background predominantly being wealth, uh, having run a licensee, I kind of put my own hat on and said, you know what, I would love to be able to use the data that's locked up in a lot of revenue and, and client uh, financial advice tools and actually get better oversight of my business. So yeah. so really having that knowledge was a, a matter of working with a lot of our licensees and said, look, what do you think about this opportunity? And they said, oh, that'd be brilliant. So we kind of then got quite focused as a project on how do we uh, enable licensees. And there's some really complicated use cases. You've got licensees who are now opening up their, their uh, architecture to allow 
um, a variety of tools to be used. And while that's great for the practice to have choice, that creates uh, some real complexity about monitoring and oversight for a, yeah. for a licensee. Yeah. So that's really brought us into the fold where we're now able to aggregate data across a number of uh, different solutions and start giving the licensee a lot more um, oversight and, and also for the practices to, to actually use that data regardless of what what one applications they're choosing to use. So, and it's an important shift in dynamic, isn't it? Because what I think none of us really honestly realised or even were aware of is because of the what you just described previously and therefore restriction on tools we could use because that's about compliance and, and oversight and things like that. In the end, the client, what the client might desire, and I'm not sort of talking about client needs as much as I am the experience, right? Yes. What the yes. experience they might desire, we just struggled to even consider. Like it just was so hard because it came from a different angle. Whereas if yep. you guys can be tentacles through all the different yep. options, then then you could create uber duper wonderful client yes. experience that then can be brought together. Totally. You know, yep. and I think I like that shift in focus. Yeah, I mean, um, mandate data, not product, is something we talk about. Yeah, okay. um, and also, I think we saw a, futur- a futurist at the Professional Planet Conference many years ago when I was still running a licensee. And they, they had a great diagram that really hit home for me where they actually put the clients in the middle of this uh, journey and said, mm-hmm. that's the client's data, not anybody else. Yeah. And that really struck a chord with me saying, how do we, how do we actually enable that? How do we allow everybody to participate in the value chain, but keep the client at the middle of it? So mm. for us, that, that was the opportunity. So like, how do we start gathering this data, allow the firm to manage the data on behalf of the client, but allow the client to also directly participate in the process as well. So really getting that um, you know, data open architecture platform, which uh, is quite, um, what's the word? We're, we're non-proprietary. We're happy that uh, you know, we'll play with anybody as long yeah. as they want to play. So yeah. <laughs> been, that's been challenging because some people uh, say they want to play and don't. Um, yep. But I think they're being, they're all coming together. They're all starting to realize that they need to work together. Um, yeah. If, and, and it's it's okay to have some overlap because everybody, you know, everyone has some competitive advantage somewhere. Mm. And, and you know, I think all of this is shifting and, and some of it at a more rapid rate than we might have expected because of the change in the dynamic of the industry. You know, it's, it's not CBA financial planning as one of the major consumers say of certain um, products and therefore defining, and when I say product, I mean tech, and then defining where that tech goes. I think that, you know, boutique advice has all these sort of things have changed. Therefore, yeah. um, what is A, possible and B, what's being demanded of tech, right? I mean, I think that's shifted. Yeah, and it's a really interesting environment, right? Because one of the things of the advantage of us having a massive amount of data, you know, we have means of, of client records across the industry. Now, we, we actually have also started doing benchmarking. Nice. And so we're seeing the average number of clients per advisor is about 125. Mm-hmm. And if you go back, you know, 10 years ago, it was probably more like 400 yeah. in the good old bad days, right? They didn't have to see a client. They just sent money. Um, yeah. And we've seen 12,000 advisors leave the industry. Mm. So we and they're not about to come back anytime soon with the barriers that are coming in. So the whole name of the game now is capacity and efficiency. Yeah. And the key to that is the, how you can leverage your data to, uh, to to make your business more efficient. How do I get data from one system moving into all my other systems without having to rekey them, for example, just simple things like that. So it, it's it's becoming very relevant. And and I think our, you know it's we've built something probably now people are actually starting to see the real value in data um, more so than ever. Absolutely. And I think data is an interesting one that the public, I think, probably have always assumed we had easy access and visibility of this stuff. It's like when you ring a bank, right? Like you can't understand. What do you mean you can't see that thing? I've got it all with that institution, you know, and and the public's like, of course you guys. Well, ah, no, actually we can't. And so I think part of this is almost keeping up with expectation rather than moving forward, you know, with it. It's almost like we're yeah. getting to the point where we actually can meet what they always thought we should have been able to do before. Well, I mean, if you map out how many times you're keying the same information across those systems uh, right now, it's still, still crazy. Um, yeah. We're still – you know, you go through the advice process, you'll lodge the business, you have to rekey the data. We've got to fix that problem. It's crazy yeah. that, um, you know, and I think it's important the client is aware of what's going on, particularly with all the data security issues. Yes. But um, it's got to be to everybody's benefit. And, um, you know, I think it's really starting to play out now. Um, it's kind of our time, I think. Let's talk about, though, for, for as a concept, there'll be some listeners who this is um, not so much as FBO is new, but this sort of data, you know, single yep. view 
um, is a little new. And so when we use the word data, we're not just talking about numbers, right? No. Yeah. So this is much more than that and, and potentially more than just fields. So talk me through what we're really talking about here in terms of um, what you guys can dive into and then, you know, sort of yeah. draw together. We've got this philosophy of no run grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and so no is really about turning that data into insights and actually allowing them to understand where they are today. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what, what is what is the information, what is the data telling them about their business, about where their pain points are, where their efficiencies uh, are, what are the clients got, you know, that that can, for an integrated firm, it's service opportunities, like this mm-hmm. client is not getting services here. Yep. Um, f- advisors are using it to review their books, look at their fees, uh, review client service offerings, all that kind of stuff. So for us, that no is really about, un- you know, you can't really go forward without having a good fact file. Yeah. So turn that into insights. And, and the tools like uh, Zeppo is not doing that. That's Power BI. We, we really right. embrace the likes of Power BI, but use whatever you want. But yep. um, that's the data open architecture where we can say, right, we've got all the data here. Now let's use something like Power BI to really uh, bring that to life for you and interact mm. with your data. <laughs> so that's kind of start. That's where we start with many firms is just like, let's tell you, let's unlock it and tell you what they, where you're at. And that's working for uh, financial planning firms as much as it is uh, wealth firms. Yep. Um, and then you get into the run, which is okay. Now that I know um, what I know, how do I how do I go forward from here? And that's really about connecting the data. So for us, that's where right. we start allowing data to move efficiently between uh, a financial planning system into a, a word document, into a signing document, into uh, a marketing tool. And so we can look at things like data automations. So okay. if one of the things we're really keen to do is. Rather than having people do manual tasks, if we can see the data is telling us something, why aren't we just doing it automatically? Mm. So we're really moving to the data automation stage where I can see it's somebody's birthday. I'll just send them an email from you and and say happy birthday as if you did it. So yeah. we can really – and, you know, uh, revenues, oh, this client's not didn't get paid. You didn't get paid for that client this month. What happened there? Let's tell yeah. you about it. So, and when it happens, I think that's the other thing is – and and. One of my greatest frustrations is the, but you've got to remember to run the report, check Correct. the report, find the exception, and then act on it. Like, oh my goodness! Like, yeah. <laughs> so we've just launched this idea of a Zippo virtual assistant, and and the whole idea is that this uh, virtual assistant actually just monitors data and acts um, upon something you've really asked it to do. Like, you know, you you're onboarding a new client, can you send out the FSG, and the uh, assistant will just do that. Um, but as to your point, it's just monitoring and watching the data. Mm. And doing things that normally you'd have to have someone like the reporting's great, but someone still ought to go to that report and look at it. So yeah. why not actually have the the automation tool look at that and say, I'll, I'll let you know when I see something worth seeing. Yeah, they're all about trying to create efficiencies for and a better experience for the client. Because um, if I can see the reviews coming up, I'll just kick off the review process. So right. um, there's a whole bunch of things we can do, and you know we're just really un- starting to untap that as technology gets better. Um, yeah. We're and really look, keen to move that data around. Yeah, and it's it's um there's so much of that we do manually, even for like yeah. I would call us a highly automated practice in benchmark against most. You know, we use yep. a lot of tech, yep. and but there's a lot of that. It's that triggering stuff that's manual. You know, it's it's that stuff. And I mean, the difference would be if to you know to remember to fill your car, you didn't get a light or you didn't get a dial. You had to either yeah. peer into the actual fuel tank, yeah. or it just runs out. Like that's the equivalent. Like this is insane. Why are we doing this? It should just be yeah. blinking light. Oh, okay. Or blinking light, and it already gets filled. Yeah. You know, like and we've also we've also got the concept of almost like a chatbot where I can actually say, "Can you send all my active clients an updated FSG, please?" Right. And it will just carry out the process. So, to your point, it's all about um, trying to automate those tasks that that take and so free your staff up. Because if I can free my staff up, I can get them to cope with you know more growth, service the advisor, uh, the clients rather, and 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 do things better. So, um, yeah, okay. and then the other thing is then moving that data. So we can now uh, connect to hundreds of applications. So, you know, marketers rather than you having to manually update a marketing, we'll just build the marketing and maintain the marketing for you in Mailchimp or Active Campaign, whatever you're using. Let's just move that data into those those apps. So, yeah, um, I think the Net Wealth Advice Tech Report talks about how most firms have about fifteen applications in play. Mm. Let's let's get them all talking to each other. So yeah. that's where yeah. we're heading at the moment. And so, look, a couple of things. This is uh, spawning a whole lot of questions, but I think something we should cover off. Um, it's easy for practices, even like mine, that are smaller. We've got our own license. Um, then to go, oh, but this is for the big guys. Is that the case? Is this only for multiple, multiple discipline, you know, over 10 advice practices? 
No, it's, I mean, there's always a price point where you see the value in that data. So that's yeah. for us. For us is that if if I can, for example, uh, uh, pick a number, $12,000 a year, if you can do this kind of technology, that's cheaper than um, having an admin do all this. Yeah. So it's all going to be aligned to that, that yeah. what's, what efficiencies are giving me. Yeah. Um, but no, we, we very much think it's about giving that scalability to a firm like yours where yeah. it starts giving you peace of mind. You know, we've got KRI tools where we're watching and looking for the, all those KRIs that uh, you're obligated to meet. Mm-hmm. If we see a fee for no service risk, we'll, we'll tell you. So, yeah. um, you know, those things are things that are scale issues. So um, the bigger, more complex it gets, then I guess the it's it's like anything, the bigger the payback. But um, we very much sell, see, you know, we're working with a lot of own AFSLs. Um, as much as we are with uh, multidisciplinary, as we are with licensees. So yeah. we're, we're very much trying to cater to all those three segments. And you said it before, but I do. I think going forward for the next few years, capacity is the thing we're going to be oh, all yeah. focusing on. Yeah. That's what it's all going to be about. And totally. it's not necessarily something that historically we've really spoken about. You know, like a productivity – Yes, but sort of in a business sense, but the capacity of an individual and even being able to get a sense of that, you know, are we in the green zone, the yellow zone or the red zone? That's, I mean, that's always been super hard to do um, yep. and you have to really have a handle on your, and I mean, we're sort of really proactively watching that stuff, but even then it's very hard to get that sense. Yeah. And that, and that's that no run grow, right? So, so where are you? What's your, what's your, what is your capacity at now? How does that compare to the benchmark? Are you ahead or behind? Yeah. And then where do you want to get to? So we've, we've kind of got an aspiration where we want to align our thinking to, at a minimum, we want to allow you to grow, uh, add 50 clients per advisor yeah, as a capacity without increasing cost. And I think one of the things that we know technology's not necessarily been succeeding is that people are trying to cut software costs. Oh, it's happening again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to share with the well, with listener here. Uh, this is hysterical. Well, so going out. While, um, you are, while you are listening um, through audio only to record these episodes, we actually have visual as well so that we can eyeball each other, yep. which is great. But once in a while, um, Paul's end goes completely dark, which is fantastic. So I'm getting, you know, sort of an <laughs> audio and a show, which is just fabulous, which hasn't We're been before. very environmentally friendly. Um, exactly, exactly. Uh, but, yeah, uh, what I was saying, sorry, picking up, is that um, – We've got to focus on that. We've got to be aligned to that efficiency growth because yeah. that's really the only way I think uh, we are able to grow at the moment. So we've got to get the advisors being able to see clients more effectively and not being caught up in other things. And this, and if we make them efficient, then what happens downstream? It's you know I use the analogy. It's like building a four lane highway, mm. and then you get to the end of it, you still got to merge in the congestion just <laughs> somewhere else, right? Oh, absolutely. The the feed into the product provider, like that's just, that's our wall actually for us. There's a lot yep. of productive we managed to extract in, in the advice operation, but when it hits implementation yep. and the providers, oh. They've been talking about that since 1996, if you can look. Yeah. So um, we, we very much want to you know, do lodgement. Once you've done that process, you know, we've got to work, the, the platform administrators need to realize that the, the lodgement doesn't start at their product. It starts well before that. Yeah. And one of our goals is to allow product place uh, the the lodgement data, the data straight into the lodgement platform. So, yeah. and, and we know that's a big one. It's just a matter of getting everybody on the journey. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's all those things we have to solve now, and they've never been more important because mm. you know it, finding good staff or finding staff um, at all is getting hard across yeah. all levels, right? So yeah. and every industry, like it's not just correct. Us, it's everywhere. So, you know. so we're kind of the enablers to that. Um, okay. We're not necessarily got all the solutions, but what we want to do is connect to those solutions. That uh, you know, digital signing is probably the biggest evolution we've seen to, in recent years compared to anything else. So you know, things like the the virtual assistant for us are things that are directly trying to remove. Like rather than talking about CRM, let's talk about no CRM. Yeah. Yeah. How do we actually do some of those tasks without you having to do them? And and look, you there's a lot of quotes like you mentioned about the you know number of clients per advisor, and the problem I've always had with those is in my mind that they were measured based on old school ways of doing things. I'm like, yep. I don't think that's actually what the capacity is. If you're optimized on a whole lot of things, if if that happens, I feel like that figure can change, but. There's a journey, right? And we do yep. have to, you know, there's layers to that. Um, and depending on the service type, of course, too. So it depends yeah, on the way you're engaging. But but it's there if you want to. Yeah. But I think, you know, we've been pretty fixated on advisor count recently. I think <laughs> we, we actually probably didn't look at the number of active, a uh, number of clients being given advice. That's because if we've lost 12,000 advisors um, and they average 125, that's 101.5 million 
or yeah. from device clients. Like, right. I don't think, hopefully it's not that bad, but that tells yeah. you what's happening and and how do they get back into the market. So we talk about digital advice. Um, that's a whole different discussion, but yeah. um, if those people want advice. They want a relationship with an advisor. And yep. at the moment, they're queued up out the front of people's offices. So the opportunity's never been better. Yeah. But the advisors have got to be able to touch it and get to it. So yes. that, to us, needs to be a priority for the for uh, tech players like us. Absolutely. Now, in terms of you know people considering this for a practice, then I'm betting there's some sort of insider tips you could give. It, it's almost before you even embark on this. And one of the things I guess I'm curious about is I think through you know how you can really get value out of having all of those insights and then being able to act on them is, for example, if if an advisor isn't looking at their process as a whole lot of micro tasks and they've still got this big provide advice, implement advice, review, like if they're looking at it in a chunky way, I'm betting that it's much harder to really get these sort of little automations happening and get this data. Is that valid? Is the sort of depth of which you understand and have really sort of mapped out your process is going to make a difference when you engage with you guys? Yeah, I, I think it's probably more, it's as much as how much you're prepared to want to make it work and invest your own resources yeah. uh, in, into this. So any tech can work if you want to make it work. Yeah. And I think uh, probably the biggest failing we see is that they buy a piece of technology and think it's just going to solve the problem. Plug it in. We've yeah. plugged it in. It's, Why is there nothing happening? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's still a car. You still got to drive it and you still yeah. got to be a proficient driver. So yeah. we always say what's the biggest success factor? And, and we always say having resources uh, within your business focused on making sure whatever you're going to do with technology, you commit to it. And does that mean you therefore would suggest all the ones, the success stories are when somebody in the practice and not necessarily the principal or somebody senior, somebody sort of takes a bit of ownership yep. for the project? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You always need a champion. And again, that's true for any piece of technology. So yeah, someone's got to be KPI to it. We've got to be really clear on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Um, and how are you going to measure success? Yeah. Uh, and how are you going to get a return on investment? And I think that's our learning. Work. Like um, our learning also is that uh, we've got to be with you along the journey. It's got to be a partnership. It's not just about us putting the technology in and walking away. Yep. Um, it needs to be a real partnership from start to as long as you're there. That's a that's a something that we've kind of really understood better in the last twelve months. Is okay because your needs will change. Mm. Like you started here, the journey was these were your problems. But in six to 12 months, those problems will change and you need uh, someone like us there to say, well, okay, what do we do about it? So right. it, it needs commitment on both sides, I guess. Mm. Getting it. It, still, it still comes down to people as much as the technology is is the enabler. Yeah, and look, I think, I mean, I can see that even with new tools like um, like a product Rex. You know, Nick's yep. done a, a great job of solving a unique yeah, problem. Cool. They're like, oh, it's so awesome. But he's rapidly responding to what all of us are going Oh, to be good if, you know, like that sort of interaction and being willing to give that without, it's not a complaint. It's just a, mate, this is awesome. But if I could also do that, that'd be fantastic. You know, that sort of dynamic, I think, um, only improves the outcome uh, yeah, for everybody. That, that's a real tech problem though is uh, when you first start out, it's very easy to do that. And then yeah. the the layers get bigger and bigger and bigger. And yeah. so- that, that everyone will fa- every product faces that challenge of yeah. making sure you don't over engineer as well. So, well, and I think the other thing too I notice, and maybe it's, this isn't a fair reflection on tech as much as it is tech within providers, for example, is they then end up having a pathway so long in yep. terms of you know the list that you all like once in a while I feel like saying to them, I think you should just delete the next 12 months of whatever you were going to do and jump. Like like just yeah. just leap into the next lot because it's it's taken to – and that's not a judgment of how long it takes. It takes time. But sometimes you've skipped the need, you know, and now we could, you know, go right past something and straight into, I don't know, two-factor or all sorts of other things that could just yeah. solve another problem. And I guess one of the things we've kind of said to ourselves is we'd like to be the smartphone of the industry. In, in other words, allow you to snap in other apps onto your yep. data in it with agility and yep. that's probably because then as as products maybe don't necessarily solve that problem as well as it used to it's not as hard to bring in other solutions that right. maybe are innovating and i think what we're seeing is uh incremental solutions are more practical than wholesale like yes. what i would call the monolith that we used to deal with in, in yes. the past across all the industries um we're more looking to, towards simpler solutions that solve a problem incrementally yeah and you know, I think that's where we're heading, or if not already. So there's some, 
I think as you're saying, post the institutional framework, we're seeing fantastic innovation like the product Rexes. Mm. But how do I bring that in without doing a whole new data migration? So right. you need that common operating layer where you know it, it becomes easy to snap in, snap out. That makes everyone very competitive. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as you say, it's, at, at some point you go, oh, you know what, this post not working for me anymore. Right. You know, and, and I'm a big, I mean, I love to have that sort of environment where you can plug something in, yeah. it gets value, but then, you know, maybe it doesn't keep up with others. Like you say, I mean, you know, so, sometimes those first to markets aren't the ones that end up being the ultimate in mix. Okay, great. Well, we can plug something else in so that that concept where there's the hub that's got yes. some, c- keeps that consistency and then you bring these things in. I mean, that's, well, for me, that's the holy grail. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that, and that's what we're trying to achieve. I mean, it's never perfect, but- no. um, it's probably more the product comes to you than you go to the product. I think yeah. that's probably a bit of a, ch- a one eighty degree flip that yes. we're really keen to say, well, no, you can actually say, come play with my data. Mm. There, there's a whole things you need to be really careful about making sure that you do own your data. Yep. And there, that varies across the, the prov- different providers where some will actually take the view that it's their data. Yeah. So, you, so there are some, and then in some cases that's quite justified. Mm. If it's like their IP, but yep. something you need to be mindful as to how much you can play with what you think is your data as well. Yeah. So th- yeah, there's all those complexities. T- yeah, exactly. Now, you, we were talking then about how things can evolve and change and therefore the needs. And one of the, thing that's com- one of the things coming up a lot more is client portals. You know, they're the new black for 2023 for advice. Yep. So yep. Uh, that's something you guys are looking at and, and how data will feed in or out of those and how that will all work in conjunction with, you know, the other tools in the practice? Yeah. So we started to build a client pool years ago um, and just went, oh, this is yeah. this varies. So we've integrated with the likes of MoneySoft in the past. Yep. Um, one of the things that – one of the key reasons, I guess, we've partnered heavily with, say, the likes of NetWealth is their whole of wealth client pool. Yep. So – We've been working with them so they can actually take that data out of Zeppo regardless of what platform the client may be in or whether they're just an accounting client. Right. And you can now use their client app to to engage with your client. Yeah. So uh, that's one example. It's 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 uh, just something that's aligned, but we yep. would take the view that that's something that if other – that they've invested in that connectivity to our platform mm. and um, you know, we, we're always – others. if others want to do that, then you know, we're open to that. So – um, I think we want to – client portals are especially tool on themselves. We, yeah. Um, it's, you know, there's there's certain lines we go, well, this is now a specialist area. Let's just facilitate data to that and let them pick what they want to use. Correct. And, and you know, from the client's perspective, what they're used to in terms of um, interactivity of apps and, and the things they can do, I agree. We need to, you know, let experts that can do that well – produce a portal and then we can, you know, blend it into the practice as opposed to these, often it's an add-on, you know, often yep. it's just sort of, oh, they can sort of look at this one thing. I'm like, that's not a portal. <laughs> it's just a window, you know. Like, oh. And I think the one thing that, um, well, we've talked about client engagement for many, many years as long as mm. I'm getting older, decades. <laughs> but um, it also, you've got to think about it. It's, it's just another, you've got to commit to a client portal. If, if yeah. and you're going to go deep or you're going to go light. and. Yeah. That's why I think you need to choose what is it just going to be for fact, find, reverse. But Correct. Are you going to go full whole hog? Correct. Now, the likes of a money soft are full comprehensive solutions that are very, very good. Yeah. But you've got to commit to that, right, like any product. Yeah. So people need choices to decide what is their requirement and they should then, again, as we were saying earlier, you've then got to commit to it. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with, um, you know, we're going in the path of, of choosing one that's a communication hub. Like there this is how we will communicate yep. in every single way. Like it's it's not a, oh, maybe once in a while thing. This is, no, yep. no, if we shift to this, this is how we do things. And for anybody that doesn't want to use that, it's an exception. You yep. know, it's a massive exception to do it. But to your point, that's the decision we've made for a virtual practice and the types of clients we have, yeah. you know, so. There's a really good taste case study where there's a large firm in Queensland that built their own client app. Right. And we uh, we have our own conference and they we got them talking about it. And at the end of the day, what when we talked about how they use the app, it became a change management discussion because yeah. they embedded the whole thing into their, their whole process. So they mandated it from the advisor, the admin to the client. That whole experience became totally integrated with their advice process. Yeah. And a given. So yeah. And it works really well. Yeah. As opposed to just having it out on the side saying, oh, it'll get used. Yeah. So. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think, um, you know, the other thing there is the difference between, you know, a communication versus a data feed. 
Correct. You know, they're different things too. So all of that is is but I like the idea of having the glue, which clearly Zeppo can be, that will help facilitate yep. that no matter where it's coming from or to hey, yeah. you know, have this one place that or this one thing that can sort of be the yep. the connective uh, tissue for sure. Things like things like SharePoint, right? Everyone's using um office SharePoint for us is where documents naturally sit, so we interact, we can reread the documents, we can generate the documents. That needs to be integrated with the client app. I don't want to be managing documents twice, right? right? So they're the kind of things we're wanting vendors to to think about, like, you know, think about the workload that gets created by having another document portal. Yeah. You need it, but I don't want to be double handling documents. So I yeah. can't how do we move data documents around efficiently to to create efficiency? Yeah. So that sort of brings to mind actually, um, you know, on the business you've got and the users you've got currently, what were the Clearly, it's not a, oh, gee, I just like the sound of Zeppo, right? This is not one of those little give it a world apps. Like, I mean, there's other ones that I suggest to people. I'm like, just give it a whirl. This is not in that category. Um, nope. This is something that, you know, is solving a bigger problem. What are some of those drivers that you've seen, like something in particular that's just caused somebody to go, this is worth embarking on this process? Yeah, so... I think some good examples would be integrated is, a, is an obvious one. They just want a single view of the client. Right. They, 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 they want a better client experience. And they just don't know what they don't know. Yep. They, want better, they want better data. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we bring it all together. We can show them the discrepancies very, very quickly. Yeah. So it's when people realize that, I think just generally, when a firm realizes that the data is the key to the future, they're the ones that work really well. They actually, they can... They realize it's not sexy, but they realize mm. it's a ticket to the game. So yeah. uh, they're prepared to invest in the in the boring stuff first to then get the leverage and the scale that comes out of that. Yeah. So I think that's how I'd probably characterize our most successful firms is yeah. that they they realize that it's not just about a, a solution. It's, it's fundamentally driven by them getting custody of their data and putting the time into it and they'll get the payback. So it, yeah. it's a bit of a longer burn, but yeah. um, it, it pays back back or in the longer term. Well, and I think, I mean, I can I see, absolutely see a use case where, you know, there's a number of practices that are going to be revisiting their fees, right, and yep. how much they charge and how that works. Well, you know, in parallel to that, then having confidence or understanding or insight into a per client profitability, like to yep. be able to actually see, <laughs> right, hold on, this one you know, because of the way we work, because of it may be because of the individual, but it also may be the service you're providing. Wow, that's got that margin, whereas this one only has this margin. Yep. I mean, that is so powerful. It is. And the other thing I'd add to that is it's living in our world. That happens every yeah. night. So yeah. it, typically at the moment, that's a project where I've got to extract the data, shape it, manipulate it, maybe even have a consultant shape it. Yeah. And I look at it, make decisions, and then it's dead. And then yeah. I've got to revisit it. So our, our view is the efficiency then becomes, well, look at it as many as your times as you like. It's going to be as of yesterday. So you can actually see the impact and yeah. track it through as well. So benchmarking for us is life benchmarking. We're not relying on a survey that happens and then it's pretty much six months old. Right. The benchmarking becomes real time. So you can actually look at how you're going. So yeah. I think it, it's just bringing the timeliness of data back too. So it, it, that is a big efficiency. And sometimes proprietors don't realize the amount of time their admins are spending building charts, reflecting all that. Oh, the, They just um, see the result, right? Yeah, because I, I, there's so much talk in our industry about the cost to produce the advice, you know, the, the, yep. the, the advice pointy end. I honestly think that going forward where a whole lot of value is sitting that's just not being realised is in support and admin. I just yep. think they're – there's just so many things and it's not their fault at all. In fact, it's quite the reverse. I think, in, you know, if we unleash them, they'd all love it. Um, yeah. But not only on, you know, doing the right task at the right time, multiple, you know, data entry, all that sort of stuff, but also being able to watch and see, well, hold on, why is, why is there so many of those queries? Oh, because we're having to call back that provider four times to get a result. You know, starting to be able to see some of those red flags of where we're almost subsidizing the uh, the institutions because of the yep. way they're working. Well, you know, I would love that insight because I'd start to bang on doors. You know, I'd start to make some noise about it. Whereas right now, if you do that, it's anecdotal. You can only really say, well, gee, I sort of know that, you know, this is happening this many times and the team say they waited for an hour and a half or whatever. But to be able to actually give that a bit more substance yep. um, through that sort of, you know, watching that live data is really powerful. 
Yeah. So we're going to do the no phase, as I call it, is all about those understanding points. So we're, we keep do, we're diving into that more and more, bringing more data to the table so they can start seeing those metrics. Yeah. Because that's half the battles. Actually, yeah. you just, okay, I don't know what I don't know. So, right, being aware. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there any area of, um, you know, for the users, the people that are currently, so do have it integrated in the practice that you you think, wow, they, they haven't even gone this far, like there's even more value, any sort of areas that you think, you know, there's some more gems out there that they could be going further with? Yeah, I mean, probably first one is particularly integrated firms not unlocking referrals across their right. teams. So okay. they quite often they'll start that journey with us, but there's barriers. Again, it's cultural in many cases. Mm. But to me, that's one of the great opportunities where if I can see a client's circumstances change or maybe they just had their birthday, so all of a sudden uh, TTR is relevant, right? So yeah. um, I, I don't feel like they're um, acting on the data uh, and taking those opportunities because mm. they're so busy they don't need to. Yep. <laughs> but uh, I think that's one area. And I think probably I think it's probably more with us to actually help educate them to take those opportunities. So I don't right. really think they're the problem. I think our challenge is to communicate those opportunities. So um, I think in the most – they're getting into it. It's keeping it current. It's it's coming back to it as the challenge. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's it is. It's what moment that we've, we, we're we constantly having to make relevant and we just keep trying to bring in new technologies to make those, those points. Fill those needs. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things and, – and, of course, this is like a multiple evolutions down the track and once you've – embedded this and and you've squeezed out every other bit of value you can yeah. where i can really see this going is is with true insights then instead of just hey we're going to have a webinar coming up next month and this is the topic it's we're having an invitation only targeted at the ones you know that need that yep. because there's a gap and it's you know the invitation that goes out is personalized there's a call that's personalized like it it can really start to narrow down so instead of a conversion rate for an invitation of those things which can be like one or two percent um it could be 80 percent because you're only sending it to the ones you know it'll give immense value definitely um, you yeah. can get very targeted we can we can actually help them do that very because we get so much data and they yeah. can be so point, uh, pointed on that. And the other thing that we haven't explored, which is uh, it's there for us to do, is is what we call predictive analytics. Yep. So we could take your data and actually start talking about uh, expected client trends. Like right. this behavior probably says that that client might be a risk or um, there's opportunities you're not picking on. So yep. the more data we get, the more we can use the, the AI engines that exist within the likes of Power BI to – Start getting there. We we haven't done that yet. We've mm. still um, got plenty of others to get to, but that's the kind of stuff that's on our roadmap. Where okay, let's let's start giving you data. Um, yeah, that's all sitting there, and it can probably tell you stuff that you didn't even realize. So. Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, you, I mean, at, at its heart, your tool is is sort of about integration, isn't it? Or certainly about data yep. sharing. And so, I'm imagining there's a big long list of things that therefore um, you guys talk to or peer into. Um, how does that work? Like, how do I, you know, if there's a practice that comes to you and they happen to use this new thing that you guys haven't worked with before, how does that work? <laughs> yeah, it's a real challenge um, because there are so many systems we have to prioritize them. It's no different to any other development company. So. Yep. We we build uh, off our own bat the ones that we have got market size um, and yes. demand. The APIs exist so people can build their own, but uh, that's easy to say. Like APIs just create Mexican stands off. And so <laughs> yeah. we'll go, we've got an API, and the other vendor will say, we've got an API, and then nothing actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've just got to prioritize. Um, yeah. We have got new technologies now that actually allow for more rapid integration okay. capabilities. So now that we've got that, we're just starting to look at how do we use that better. But yeah, it's like it's a challenge. It's not easy solved. Um, yeah, and so we we very much let the client demand drive our priorities. Yeah, um, when I just said I was going to build that because it's cool. Like you know, <laughs> we started with the likes of X Plan, the zeros, the APSs, the yep. you know, classes as well because we knew they were they were, they were in demand, being well well used. Um, yep. uh, and we we are like particularly in financial services, we're just at the moment pretty much connecting to the broader range now because the demand started to get there, right? So yeah. Um, so more and more connections are coming, and they're they're, they're working with us. So okay, the, and part of that's their willingness, and part of that's also the, the large licensees that have opened up their architecture. Yeah, pretty much saying you can play, but you've got to connect to our data source, right? And therefore, uh, that allows the licensee to allow them to play in their group. Yep, 
but on the basis they get the data so they can manage and meet their licensing obligations. So yeah, okay. it's a bit of a triangle going on there where yeah. um, it's it's kind of self-serving. And, I mean, it makes sense that it's the, you know, say, for example, the advice tools. What about the more generic CRMs? Like, have you guys gone down the path of any of the, I mean, what's one off the top of my head, Salesforce, or, you know, others that are sort of the more generic ones, have, have they come up as well? Uh, they come up. We've, we built a, a basic CRM in our solution. Yep. Um, we did that because we, we originally just used Dynamics because mm-hmm. we didn't see any, why would we build a CRM? Um, our clients actually took us on that journey. <laughs> And so that's kind of been good and bad because I think other CRMs see those as a bit of competition. Right. But we, we, we see that as a very simple option. Um, uh, we've connected to a couple of other CRMs, but it's probably the one area where I think we've still got to come together with those other CRMs to say, look, you know, CRM is choice as far as yeah. we're concerned. Yeah. And and there are things our CRM intentionally does not do. And and sales forces of the world are, you know, if you want to embrace that kind of product, we're never going to compete with that. We don't yeah. want to. So, yeah. Have we integrated with those? Not, not so much to this point, but we'd yeah, like okay. to. Yeah, and I, and ultimately, um, it's probably well for me. What I've seen is is been a bit of a restriction of our. Your, I mean, you described a client center center or client centric approach. Those tools are the ones that have outside of our industry have you know always tried to have that at the very least. Whereas, yeah, you know, the tools within the industry sort of has an almost I guess advice process centric. Correct. <laughs> like yeah, that's where they you know the center is. So so yeah, I, I I can see the positive to some of those coming in because it sort of forces that shift. Yeah. So so it seems a really interesting one, right? Because I think a lot of people are embracing alternative CRMs because mm. they want more in that area. Yeah. But CRM in itself is is a really hard area to play because it's it directly affects everyone in the business. It's, mm. it's all about your processes. It's all about those components. So it's not an easy thing to change from whatever you're doing now to where yeah. you go. Yeah. And so why data helps, um, don't underestimate the, the time and effort and commitment you need to make to make to do whatever that. CRM. Yeah, you need to embrace it properly like we were discussing yeah. earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so – Looking forward, you know, there might be some, you know, things are coming up on the development path. I'm curious about those, but I'm also curious about the where you'd love it to go, you know, where, like the sort of wish list that's a bit further down the track as well for Zeppo. Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, look, just more connections, more velocity of data. Uh, that's probably the high level. We'd, we'd love to see uh, straight through the platform. Yeah. We'd love to, you know, we'd, more interactions with the other products in your ecosystem so that when I make a change, I know it's just going to flow through nice and efficiently. Yeah, sending data to other systems is sometimes easy and sometimes quite problematic. I've yep. done it with my lights. <laughs> so you know that's probably just the general statement. Like more data, more connections is is kind of our priority. It's not easy. Yeah. It's quite a complicated thing to do. Yeah, data security, all those types of things have to be thought through. So that's probably the high level aspiration, mm-hmm. and probably you know just more automations. So I, we talk a lot about data process and you know, document automations. Mm-hmm. How do we do more without you having to do piecing? Yeah. So that's probably this the that kind of goes hand in hand with that first statement about more connections. But we want to create that capacity. That's uh, so that's a generic statement. Like it's um, because it's quite far reaching. So it's a big mm. it's a big challenge. But you know, just better interaction with Office three six five. Yep. Yeah, and those core systems, your marketing tools. Yeah. Your platforms, your your life providers, that kind of stuff for us is who we'd love to play. And there's just so many. If you can get that far, there's so many ways that can evolve. Um, because yep. even, even you know, okay, we've created this thing. It's got to get posted out. It can auto go to the mailhouse. You know, like there's some things that that we all just see as a given that we all have to do, which actually you don't. It just requires so many layers, like you say, of analysis, development, attention. You know, to get there, but it's possible. You know, truly, this stuff is possible. It's just going to take some time um, and some work to sort of get to that point. Uh, and so, it's exciting to have sort of a a um, you know an offer that can help facilitate that without it being quite so horribilis. Although it still is going to be hard, you know. But it's hard, yeah. Yeah, I mean, but if it was I easy. Think, we would all everyone would do it. Huh? So. That's a thing, right? I mean, and and. It's an interesting um, restriction on the industry. I, I, you know, innovation is such a funny word, and and I think I always sort of bring it back to the fact that you know, outside of our industry, there's other think people doing things far in ahead of where we're at. 
and I and I feel like we've got to remind ourselves of that all the time because I can I can I can say oh what we do is really advanced you know maybe it is in our industry but it ain't when you yep. go outside of it I, I think it's changing because of now that the institutions of they, they've pretty much controlled innovation in many ways because yeah. the, the practices waited on them yeah so I think innovation is definitely speeding up in many parts so we're seeing yeah. some good stuff happen. Yeah. And then the other bit I add is don't don't forget what we do as financial advice is actually really hard. Yeah. And don't beat yourself up too much because actually it is if it was easy what people do would be online and it would just happen. So Right. Um there there is a balancing act of what I'd say, well, good quality advice is about sitting in front of a client and that one hour meeting is always gonna be a one hour meeting or yeah. you know, it goes for. So yeah. That that's a bit of pragmatism I would put to it. Yeah, but I think um, what's exciting about this stuff is is I think we can turn fear of, oh, call it robo or AI, all these sort of things that people can potentially be fearful of if they're impacted in industry into yep. excitement because it lets us be more human. Like if if these things can be automated, if they, this, this can all happen magically, imagine the time you can spend actually being human with clients. Correct. I think yep. that is exciting. Yeah. And that's our... We talk about it internally. They're probably sick of me talking about it. It's all about capacity. We've got to, yeah. if we're not giving the practice some kind of efficiency return, yeah. then why are we even bothering? Because that, it make, they don't have time to do any of this. So yeah. Um, yeah. We, need, we need to fix that challenge. That, that to us is the number one issue in the industry today. Awesome. Is there anything we've missed? Anything we haven't touched on? No, I think you covered it pretty well, actually. You've, mm. you've got right into it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not easy. Nothing's easy. Technology is no. always a, a challenge, but. Um, I think we've, ta- as you said, we're crazy to take on what we have, and I think it's only it's been a long journey for seven years. With, but I think we're already starting to see what's happening now. Exciting! All right, advice explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Zeppo, then the website link is in the episode show notes, along with Paul's LinkedIn details. I'm sure if you reached out, he'd point you in the right direction of what body internally um, could answer your queries or engage um, on the sort of thing you might be attempting to do. But look, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and for sort of really, you know, bringing to life a tool that in the end will be able to give us a really three-dimensional view of our clients and our businesses, you know, I think that's exciting for it actually to stop being just this really static thing um, and, you know, one moment in time of data to turn that into something, a, an organism living and breathing is really exciting. So congratulations on the efforts so far and please keep up the good work because <laughs> we Thanks, need it. Not at all. It's been a great time talking to you. I really appreciate it. Wow. So are you in a practice that currently uses Zippo? Um, how are you aware it's there? How much do you interface with it or, or can see the value it produces? I think most of us would be fascinated um, for anybody that's in one of those practices or even run one's practice using Zeppo. I uh, would love you to share on the Ensemble platform. Um this is, you know, the next wave. It's the next thing that we're all going to be focusing on um, data and the way we can really utilize it and can use it as connective tissue in our practices. So please, please share your ideas and experiences and tips um, with other advisors. And as for sort of my thoughts on this, you know, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, advisors will often reflect that, hey, you know, for accountants, you know, tax returns, when you do your tax return, it's always looking back, it's after the fact, and therefore it's difficult to improve anything because it's sort of a bit too late to make any changes. What's interesting, though, is that very approach is often how we're sort of running our advice businesses, right? We we might do an analysis at a point in time. It might happen at the end of the year or, you know, that sort of timing. At one point in time, we check out um, what's happening and we decide, you know what, to optimise or to improve productivity, let's change a process or add a step. But then once we do that, we've only sort of got anecdotal evidence of the impact and maybe only when we look at it again in 12 months, do another analysis, will we see whether there's, you know, any improvement or, or what sort of actual value that decision made. You know, imagine instead, you know, a world where we could even do A, B testing on process changes or engagement techniques or, you know, trial a change to an internal process to see if there's an immediate impact, like really being able to test and tweak um, to result in optimization. Whereas currently you sort of have to make a decision, implement, and you're stuck with it, right? So so I think, um, you know, live data is 
is what we all need to be able to have that approach. Ultimately, it's a journey. I'm not saying it exists right now, but but you know what a start if we can get that live data and tools like Zippo um, that sort of collate all of that data across across multiple sources are the connective tissue required to get us there. You know, I know I'll be closely watching Zippo and what they can do. You know, we're a practice obsessed with processes and effectiveness and particularly using tech to automate things that a human simply isn't required for, um, but we're doing it anyway. And, you know, data being both accessible and visible uh, and transparent and all in one place can amplify those efforts considerably. Uh, so without a doubt, i um, g- going to be keeping a close eye on what they're doing and how they're progressing. Now, as you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. So to help you build that app habit, whew, today's Curiosity Corner app that I just wanted to, to share with you is Opal. Now, no, 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 Sydney Siders, I'm not referring to your Opal card used to pay for public transport. Um, this is actually an app. Uh, you can find it at opal.so, O-P-A-L dot S-O, and their tagline is find your focus. Now, it might seem counterintuitive for a tech podcast uh, to be highlighting an app that helps you reduce screen time, right? You might think, really, Peter? It feels like that's that's opposing every other episode we've had. Um, however, I'm a big believer in using tools well, not mindlessly, right? And I figure that things like Opal can help break us out of our smartphone addiction, particularly when we're at home, if no other other no other time. Uh, so you may have already tried uh, screen time features. I think most phones have that sort of what what time have you spent on your screen and it's giving you that feedback. Um, but the difference, as I understand it, is with Opal, you get to apply a combination of restricting apps that you can get to in certain times giving you real-time feedback, but also rewards so that you can begin to focus much better um, on the thing you want to focus on right now uh, and snap ourselves out of that phone zombie mode that we all get into. Uh, So please, if you do check it out, let me know and I'd love to hear how you go uh, and how it manages to give you a little bit of sanity back perhaps. (laughs) Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix Order magically sent to you each Friday. And if you're keen to hold a team building event that really ignites their curiosity, then I would love to run an Awaken the Misfit Within workshop for your team, where we sort of get them out of survival mode. We move beyond just adulting and we really start adventuring. The conversations and the connections created in these workshops are incredible. And as your team build their curiosity muscle, then they're also learning a skill that can be applied in the practice in your future innovation efforts. So it's got a bit of a a double whammy benefit there. If this is of interest, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, Advice Explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 